good morning, everybody. I'm very honored to be speaking here. I have to find this a very alien environment to, compared to the usual sort of undertaker tones that we get in most medical conferences. However, I'm very impressed by the technology, and I would very much like the, this technology in the NHS. As you know, the NHS technology doesn't work all that well. I have been a professor of respiratory medicine in Oxford, and I've spent the last 30 years of my life looking after people who have this condition. And the reason why it's important we treat it is because it's a cause of excessive daytime sleepiness, and that's a cause of road traffic accidents. And I'm here to try and convince you that we need to take this considerably more seriously. Um, and I'm also here representing something called the OSA Partnership Group, which is a loose association of people who have a specific interest in trying to reduce the number of accidents that are associated with this medical condition. Uh, we have representatives from these organizations here, um, and they all play an active part in trying to improve uh, the care and quality of care of these individuals who have this condition. So why do employers need to know a lot more about this condition of obstructive sleep apnea? Well, first of all, it's considerably more common than we ever thought it was, and perhaps one in 10 of middle-aged men have a degree of this condition, sleep apnea, and because it causes excessive daytime sleepiness, there is absolutely no question that it increases the risk of road traffic accidents. The good news is that it's easily recognized if you use the right procedures, and easily treated. And we know that treatment reduces the risk of accidents back down to the normal background level. So what is obstructive sleep apnea? Obstructive sleep apnea is where, when you fall asleep, the back of your throat narrows and blocks off. And this can happen hundreds of times a night, and it's nearly always associated with loud snoring and snorting. These multiple pauses in breathing, which are only overcome by waking up, badly disturb sleep. But unfortunately, the arousal that this causes is usually sufficiently short that people are not aware that they are waking up. So as far as they are concerned, they're sleeping deeply and have no idea why they wake up feeling knackered and excessively sleepy. And in addition to excessive daytime sleepiness, probably the major cause of the increase in accidents, the quality of life of these individuals is quite severely reduced. If you are very, very sleepy, you don't really want to do very much and you withdraw from social activities and you get a reputation for being lazy and disinterested and it's not your fault. Now, treating people with sleep apnea and sleepiness, it's often called the obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, where the word syndrome means that you have significant symptoms, brings great rewards. Uh, incidentally, I forgot to say, if you want to see a video of somebody with obstructive sleep apnea, then we have a stand at the far end from here of the hall, and there's a, 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 a video going all around on a circuit uh, showing somebody having sleep apnea, and it's very useful to actually see it, because then you have in your mind exactly what is going on, and in association with that, there's a clip of somebody who has obstructive sleep apnea, and it's a cab cam showing him falling asleep and having an accident, which really makes the point that nodding off is not a good thing to do. And the treatment of this is with something called continuous positive airway pressure, and it brings very rapid relief of symptoms. Almost within one night, and certainly within a few nights, people's sleep returns to normal, and their daytime vigilance and sleepiness return to normal. And because the excessive sleepiness is disappearing, the increased accident rate returns to normal. And I believe it's extremely important for drivers' employers to take this seriously and for drivers to seek treatment. And as I mentioned before, not only does your driving improve, but your quality of life improves as well and productivity uh, and sick days, etc., all improve too. Now, there's the issue of screening, and this is a very um, contentious area. And I would stress that we would not advocate compulsory screening for this medical condition. It is common enough to make screening worthwhile. And there are haulage companies in the United States who have already introduced mandatory screening for sleep apnea, and if you're not prepared to have the screening, 
and treatment if you're diagnosed, you are not going to be employed any longer. And I do not feel that that is the way to go at all. But we are working with haulage companies to offer voluntary screening programs to support drivers with this condition. And just as an example of the many ways we're trying to tackle this, here is, for example, a poster that goes up in the restrooms so that people absorb by osmosis almost information about sleep apnea so that when the company says to them, look, we'd rather like to screen for sleep apnea, we think it's in your best interests, they at least have some background information about what this is all about. And here's a quote from Michael Errington, uh, who's the head of HR and training at Nagel Langdon's, with whom we're currently doing a very successful screening program. And he says, we believe introducing a voluntary screening program is a win-win situation for Nagel. By supporting treatment for those who are found to have sleep apnea, we get safer driver, more, motivate, more motivated staff, while the individual gains from improved quality of life and health are considerable. Now, one of the main problems that we feel is that if a driver is worried he might have sleep apnea, he is worried that he will be dry, losing his license, and therefore will tend not to come forward for fear of losing his livelihood. And that's something I fully understand. I met many patients during my professional career who had only come to us after they've had an accident, had already been stopped from driving, and were desperate to try and get back again. We would very much like to get them before they have their accidents. So we are pushing for something called the four-week campaign. This was launched now two years ago and calls for fast tracking of treat of, uh, for treatment of vocational drivers. So this means that from the time you present to your GP, you can be guaranteed that you will be treated and back on the road within a month. There's a pilot done by a colleague of mine in Freeman, uh, the Freeman Hospital in Newcastle showing that it's entirely doable. Even though the NHS has problems, this is not a difficult thing to organize and provide. And there are now many sleep clinics across the UK who have introduced fast tracking, but this is by no means universal because there is no universal directive to do this. NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which drives quite a lot of the practice that I and others follow, has introduced a recommendation to GPs that they request fast-track treatment when referring vocational drivers, but this is not mandatory. We are hoping that NICE will produce guidelines that will include something like a four-week mandatory wait, um, but NICE's processes take so long um, that we can't really wait. It's going to be three or four years at least. But in the meantime, we would like you to support this campaign and possibly consider introducing screening programs within your drivers. So, key points. Sleep apnea is common. Possibly 10% of your driving workforce are likely to have a degree of sleep apnea that is likely to be reducing their vigilance while they are driving and causing traffic accidents. It's easily diagnosed and treated. There are benefits to both sufferers and their employees, and this will only happen if drivers' employers know about sleep apnea and are confident that diagnosis and treatment can be carried out quickly. And we have a campaign for fast-tracking drivers, and we feel that GPs should be encouraged to take advantage of that fast-tracking. Further information about sleep apnea can come from an excellent website run by Patients for Patients, Sleep Apnea Trust, organization. So, on to the audience questions. So, do you think vocational drivers would come forward for treatment with sleepiness if they, if they believed it was due to a medical condition? So, yes, they would be quite happy to come forward. No, they'd be very concerned about losing their license. And they'd only come forward if they knew there was a guaranteed treatment period uh, before they would get back to work. So, vote now. Yes, that's pretty much, sadly, what I thought. We have done a survey a little bit like this in the past, 
and the number of fleet operators who thought their drivers would be prepared to come forward was very, very low. And so fear of losing your job is probably the main bar to getting this condition diagnosed. So next question. If there was a nationwide four-week wait service available for vocational drivers, would your company be more likely to introduce a voluntary screening program? It's fair to say that many companies treat this like a can of worms issue. If I don't know about it, don't hear about it, I don't have to worry about it. But unfortunately, the accidents are still going to happen. So, would you be more likely to have a screening program? Wouldn't really make any difference, or you're not really sure whether it would make a difference. So, vote now. Excellent. Just what we wanted to hear. Thank you very much. Uh, we feel it's a very important initiative and we'd very much like your support for this in any way that you can think of. And certainly if our organization approaches any of you, it'd be helpful to have a really good positive response about the possibility of screening. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate that was somewhat different to your usual presentations. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, lots and lots of questions, John. Um, in fact, too many to, to deal with now. I, I'd suggest, because there's a lot of interest out there, that you go and talk to John um, uh, on, on the stand later on. Very but, happy um, to do that. A couple of quick ones. Um, is lifestyle obesity a contributory factor? Yes, there's no doubt that increasing weight increases the probability of this condition, but it's not exclusive to overweight people, but unfortunately it's a significant contributor. Can you diagnose it yourself? I think your partner is more likely to diagnose it because they are the ones who will be disturbed by the heavy snoring and probably witnessing the stopping breathing episodes. So I think if you've been told you snore heavily, you have stopping breathing episodes at night, you're excessively sleepy during the day, and you'll probably tend to be on the larger side than normal, there's quite a high probability you have it. You have it. And what is the treatment? The treatment, uh, the, the dominant treatment, is a particularly harmless treatment. It does no harm, but it is a little bizarre if you've never heard or seen it before. It involves wearing a little mask over the nose, tiny little mask, connected to a little blur by the bed, which raises the pressure in the back of your throat and completely abolishes the stopping breathing episode, the snoring, your sleep goes back to normal, you wake up feeling refreshed. And it's a truly e extraordinary treatment. In my whole clinical career, it has been the most satisfying treatment to offer people because it brings the most extraordinary benefits. Right, okay. A big round of applause for Professor John much. Stradling. Thank you, John. <laughs>